Hello, I am the Nerdy Apologist, and on this channel we use the tools of faith and reason to come to a knowledge of the truth. This is the final video in a video series I am doing on Christian apologetics, so if you have not seen the previous videos, please check those out before continuing with this one. Also, if you like these videos and you want to see more, please don't forget to like them and subscribe to my channel. At the end of the last video, I talked about the sign of Jonah, and how this means that Jesus' claims to divinity will either be vindicated or falsified, depending on whether Jesus rose from the dead. In this video, I will prove that he did. This may seem like a very daunting task, but all we have to do is prove four things. That Jesus died by crucifixion, that he was buried, that his tomb was found empty three days later, and that Jesus appeared to his disciples alive again. First, Jesus died by crucifixion. This is about as certain as any event can be. All four Gospels mention it, Paul's letters mention it, the Church Fathers mention it, and Tacitus and Josephus mention it. We have more sources and earlier sources for this event than we have for most other events in the ancient world. Also, when you consider that victims of crucifixion were looked down upon in society and seen as cursed by God or the gods, this is not something the disciples would ever make up about a man they loved so dearly. You'll see that a lot as we look through the evidence. There are many events recorded in the Gospels that the disciples would never have made up unless they were true. But how effective was crucifixion? Could Jesus have possibly been mistaken as being dead? No. Jesus was sentenced to be flogged before he was crucified, and Roman floggings were extremely brutal. Remember the Passion of the Christ? The level of gore in that movie was accurate. The Romans were flat-out sadistic. We have records of people's intestines being spilled out and their spines being laid bare. In fact, many people died just from the flogging itself. When it comes to crucifixion, we have only one record from Josephus of someone surviving crucifixion, and he was given the best medical care possible. We have no evidence that Jesus underwent this type of care. Also, the soldiers had to make sure that the victims were dead, otherwise they themselves would have been executed. And let's not forget what John's Gospel reports about Jesus' side being pierced. If you recall from a previous video, we saw that the account of blood and water coming out from Jesus' side implies that his heart was pierced, and also lends credibility to this being an eyewitness account. Even if the crucifixion hadn't killed him already, this would have. Jesus was as dead as a doornail. Next, we can show that Jesus was buried in a tomb. All four Gospels mention this, as does an early creed in 1 Corinthians 15, which says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. The word for buried is etaphe, which implies being buried in a tomb. Also, the Gospels mention that Jesus was buried at the discretion of Joseph of Arimathea, who was a member of the Jewish council that condemned Jesus. Meanwhile, all the disciples fled, except for one. Again, the disciples would not have made this up, especially given that the early Christians were very bitter towards Jewish authorities. The criterion of embarrassment lends credence to these accounts. But were crucified victims allowed to be buried, especially given how dishonorable crucifixion was? While there is evidence of a custom to leave crucified victims on the cross or to throw them into a mass grave, Josephus does mention that Jews were allowed to bury crucified victims, and we have archaeological evidence that some crucified victims were buried. Plus, we have no ancient sources that dispute the claim that Jesus was buried. Next, Jesus' tomb was found empty three days later. The biggest reason we know this is, once again, the criterion of embarrassment. Women were not viewed very highly in the ancient world, and their testimony was seen as unreliable. Yet all four Gospels mention that the tomb was found empty by women. If the disciples were to make up a story about discovering Jesus' empty tomb, they likely would have chosen Peter or John to do so. The Gospels would never report women discovering the empty tomb, and thus that is how it really happened. Also, competing Jewish tradition presumes both that the tomb was empty and that the disciples were preaching that the tomb was empty. Matthew's Gospel reports the Jewish tradition that the disciples stole Jesus' body, and St. Justin Martyr had to respond to this claim in the second century. Now, if the official Jewish response to Christianity is that the disciples stole the body, that kind of implies that they couldn't find the body. Also, because all our sources indicate that Christianity began in Jerusalem, it would have been ridiculously easy to disprove the empty tomb story if it weren't true. Next, Jesus appeared alive again. One of our earliest sources for this is the Creed in 1 Corinthians I mentioned earlier. I've already read the beginning of it, but it continues. He appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. 
then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. This testimony is incredibly important for several reasons. First, no one disputes that Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. Second, the language Paul uses here strongly implies that this statement is an early creed. Third, based on the date of 1 Corinthians and the date for when Paul most likely would have received this creed, even the most skeptical scholars date this creed to within three years of Jesus' death. This is remarkably early testimony that Jesus was raised from the dead. Also, this is independent from the Gospels, as it mentions several appearances not found in the Gospels, like the appearance to James and the independent appearance to Cephas, or Peter. Furthermore, this mentions appearances to skeptics, namely James and Paul, who became convinced that Jesus had risen from the dead. The best explanation for all of these facts is that Jesus was actually raised from the dead. Competing hypotheses just don't hold up. What about the mythic theory that says that the later church just made these stories up? Well, these accounts are simply far too early to be mythic. A. N. Sherwin White, a historian from Oxford University, says that it takes more than two generations for legends to develop, even in the ancient world. Contrast this with the creed in 1 Corinthians that dates to within three years of the crucifixion. It's also likely that the Synoptic Gospels and Acts were written before the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, which dates them to within 40 years of the crucifixion. Again, this is far too early for a legend to develop, especially because people were still alive who could have falsified these accounts if they weren't true. But what about the swoon theory? Maybe Jesus didn't actually die. Oh, oh wait, we already showed that he did. Also, even if Jesus did survive the crucifixion, the state of his body wouldn't have exactly made the disciples fall down and worship him. So there goes that idea. All right, what about the conspiracy theory? Maybe the disciples made it all up. My question is, why would they do that? What exactly would they have gotten out of it? They didn't get rich off of this. They didn't get girls from this. They certainly didn't become popular because of this. Christianity was heavily persecuted in the first century, and yet not one of the apostles ever recanted his testimony. In fact, many of them were willingly martyred, including James and Paul, who were initially skeptics. What caused Paul, a man who vehemently hated and killed Christians, to all of a sudden make up a resurrection appearance and become one of them, even though from a worldly perspective it lost him everything, including his life? Now, many people misunderstand this argument. Don't people die for their faith all the time, they say? Yes, they do. I'm not saying that the resurrection is true just because people died for it. I'm saying that the apostles didn't lie about the resurrection because they died for it. People don't suffer and die for lies. Also, you have to remember that the Romans were very effective at disproving movements they didn't like. Check the link in the description. Why weren't they able to do this with Christianity? Plus, the whole idea of the resurrection is simply too countercultural to have been made up. Jews believed in one general resurrection at the end of time. The idea of one person being resurrected in advance was simply absurd to them. Gentiles, on the other hand, believed that the material world was evil and that the physical body was a prison from which we are released at death. Making physical bodily resurrection the center of the religion would likewise have been absurd to them. Why would they have made something up that went completely against cultural expectations? But what about the hallucination theory? The disciples were certainly grieving over the death of Jesus, so maybe their grief just induced hallucinations of him. Of all the competing hypotheses to the resurrection, this one seems to me the most plausible, but it still has several problems. For one thing, hallucinations are highly subjective. They only happen to one person at a time. Group hallucinations simply do not happen. Yet the disciples report seeing Jesus in large groups. The largest recorded is over 500. Getting 500 people to hallucinate the exact same thing would take a miracle in and of itself. The group appearances made up then? Well, that just takes us back to the conspiracy theory, which we already disproved. There's also the fact that the apostles knew what visions and subjective experiences were, and they always recognized them as such. For example, in Acts 10, Peter has a vision of Jesus, but he recognizes it as just that, a subjective vision. Yet the apostles all preached Jesus' objective bodily resurrection. Why were they able to recognize some things as subjective experiences, but not the supposed hallucinations they had of Jesus? Also, the resurrection appearances in the Gospels don't sound like ordinary hallucinations. Don't just take it from me. Take it from this guy who runs a YouTube channel called Knowing Better. 
As far as I know, this guy isn't even Christian, and in a video that has absolutely nothing to do with Christianity or the resurrection, he says this about hallucinations. Clay doesn't appear to have any delusions, but he is experiencing hallucinations, seeing or hearing something that isn't actually there. <coughs> hallucinations come in many different forms and affect literally every sense. A good example of a tactile hallucination is when you feel your phone vibrate in your pocket, but when you go to... I'm actually convinced that it does vibrate because sometimes when I look I'll see the notification dis- Anyway, most hallucinations that we're concerned with are either auditory, so you're hearing voices, or visual, you're seeing things. Clay is experiencing both, an audio-visual hallucination of a girl who isn't really there, which is rare but not impossible. The problem with this depiction is how he responds to and interacts with the hallucination. Firstly, hallucinations are usually quick or fleeting. They appear for a moment and then hide behind a tree or a corner when you try to get a better look, and then when you go to investigate, they're gone. Does this sound anything like the resurrection appearances? The resurrection appearances happened over a long period of time and involved three senses, sight, hearing, and touch. The guy in the video clip already said two sense hallucinations are rare. Imagine how much rarer three sense hallucinations are. And we're expected to believe that hundreds of people in the first century all just happened to have these hallucinations about the exact same dead guy that convinced him that he was truly raised from the dead? Furthermore, grief-induced hallucinations, as the name implies, happen to people who are grieving the loss of a loved one, and unlike schizophrenic hallucinations, which is what this man is describing, tend to be a source of comfort. Meanwhile, Paul and James were not grieving the death of Jesus, and knowledge that he's alive again would not have been very comforting. Why did these men hallucinate? Like the conspiracy theory, the hallucination theory doesn't explain the conversion of skeptics. Also, it doesn't explain the empty tomb. Even if all these people had hallucinations, anti-Christian authorities would have still been able to point out that Jesus' tomb wasn't empty, yet we've already shown that they were unable to do that. Okay, then maybe Jesus had a twin brother. Wait, wait people actually believe this? People are really this desperate to avoid the conclusion that Jesus was raised from the dead? First of all, why would Jesus' supposed twin brother want to fake Jesus' resurrection and deceive the apostles in the first place? Second of all, why wouldn't the apostles have known about Jesus' twin brother? Matthew and John were certainly aware of Jesus' family, as were most Jews in Jesus' community. This is mentioned several times in the Gospels. If Jewish authorities knew about Jesus' family, wouldn't it have been ridiculously easy for them to disprove the resurrection just by saying, No, you actually saw Jesus' brother. Heck, what about James? One of Jesus' own brothers! Why wouldn't he have known about this? Why didn't he think to investigate whether it was Jesus appearing to the disciples or his twin brother? This also doesn't explain the ascension. I mean, seriously, how was Jesus' twin brother supposed to have pulled that one off? Nor does it explain the conversion of Paul. This is seriously the most ad hoc idea I have ever heard. But, many people still say, isn't the resurrection still less probable than any of these alternative explanations? Aren't miracles always the least probable explanation? only if you already have a prior commitment to naturalism. Remember my first video when I said that I'm a classical apologist, meaning I argue for God's existence first and then the resurrection? This is why. If you already accept that God exists, then you know that miracles are possible, so the level of evidence I've given should be enough to convince you. Braxton Hunter has a really nice way of explaining this called recalibrated plausibility. If you want to know more, check the link in the description. So we've shown that God exists, that given our sinfulness we should expect God to become man, that Jesus claimed to be God, and that Jesus rose from the dead. But if Jesus rose from the dead, then that vindicates his claim to be God. And if Jesus is God, then Christianity is true. I rest my case. So that's it for this video and this video series. Please like and subscribe if you want to see more. I will see you all in my next video. God bless.